Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips. And uh, you're watching this the weekend after our conference, although we're filming it the weekend of our conference. That's why I have special guests here, like Peter Bragan, my, fam my favorite psychiatrist. Actually, I have to correct that. Um, one of my favorite people, not just favorite psychiatrists, one of my thank, favorite thank people. Thank God for that. That's a, that's a much bigger... It's a much better universe <laughs> than favorite psychiatrists. Right. Which doesn't say much. That's a, exactly, exactly. So anyway, um, so by the time you're watching, this conference will be over. And in case you really, really wish you'd been here, we do have conference videos that you can purchase access to. So send me an email at pampopper at msn.com if you want to watch the main session lectures and panel discussions and that sort of thing. And then what will happen is you're going to watch those things and say, oh my gosh, I'm not missing it next year. And you're going to get yourself registered at the lowest rate right away. So anyway, but I thought I would take advantage of this opportunity to talk about something that I get a lot of emails about. And I have stayed away from writing about because I really don't feel that I have the expertise to do it as much as Dr. Bragan, Peter Bragan here. And that has to do with the, um, the school shootings and um, the violent acts like the Las Vegas uh, situation, which um, it makes me hyster I mean, it just makes my head explode when I see what happens afterwards because the first thing, the first thing you hear all the newscasters talking about and the talking heads and the experts is, oh my gosh, we've got to do the gun control. And then the second thing right after that is we need changes in the mental health system. I agree with that. But we've got to get people to, um, to the place where they're getting help sooner so that there's intervention. And the reality of the situation is that a lot of these people, most of them in fact, are getting help from the mental health system. That is the problem. So I have the person who is qualified to talk about this, not me, with me. And I'm going to let you talk about this issue because it's very concerning. We will most likely have more of it. And I think what everybody would like to know, what I'd like for my audience to know, is what's really going on with this? What's causing it? Well, there's a number of things that go into being a school shooter, some of which are kind of generic to being a violent person. And most of the school shooters in particular, the younger people, have been through what they feel is brutalization at school, humiliation, bullying at school. Um, most of them don't feel closely connected to family or to friends, and most of them are loners. And they develop a viewpoint of um, resenting and hating society and resenting and hating their fellow students. But this uh, was going on, uh, you know, for a lot longer time than we've had school shootings, that we've had students back in the 50s. I mean, when I was in high school, uh, we had students who were angry and hostile and, and isolated and didn't have good families uh, often, and uh, who certainly uh, got into fights and insulted people. But even though guns were available, um, and uh, shotguns, uh, there were even farms near enough by for kids to get shotguns. There were no school shootings. It never even was a part of consciousness. So something has changed in the whole consciousness of people about planning for a school shooting. And by the way, this goes along with young people also thinking about suicide and planning suicide, because that's also in the air. It's in the environment. It's in the uh, movies the kids watch, it's in the videos they watch, uh, the idea of people killing each other and you know, killing themselves. So there's been a big cultural shift toward violence and, and for that we, we have to look at the, at the marketing to children of violent things, violent movies, violent videos, things like that. So that's one very, very large issue. It, it, it can't simply be the guns because guns make it more possible for people to hurt large numbers of people. There's no way around that. But um, the, the mass shootings, uh, especially in a school, school yard level or a school level, were almost non-existent uh, um, prior to Columbine, which was a kind of a, a watershed in our society. <clears throat> and in fact, those boys were wanted to establish a new kind of era, and they did in many ways, because they did establish a, a new standard for being violent, and they did establish uh, new possibilities and, uh, 
and copycats. So, and what would cause somebody to set that as a goal? Well, I think that uh, I think drugs play a big role in that, psychiatric drugs, but I think it's also evolving within the society as we are just becoming more and more a uh, violent society. When you have video games where you get scored on how many people you kill, um, and children are watching those games, which are essentially military training films in many ways. Um, what do you expect? Mm -hmm. You know, and when when our uh, our movies, our uh, our action movies, are filled with uh, you know heroes who kill as many people as possible in as many different ways as possible. I mean, we're we're influencing our children, just as when we had movies where people didn't make love on screen or have sex on screen, and when uh, it was uh, pretty advanced if mom and dad were in the same bed uh, and they always had their full pajamas on at the least. Um, and then you move on to another whole uh, level of sexual activity on the screen, you change what children expect and what mm -hmm. adults expect. So Normal becomes different. Normal it's a becomes new normal. different, and the possibility of imagining uh, becomes very different over time, if, uh, if you're given the idea that you can imagine any level of violence or any level or form of sex, then, then the imagination of uh, your, even your more imaginative people uh, changes. So this is all very society-wide. Mm -hmm. um, the role of the drugs is very interesting. Because you're, and you're talking about psychiatric drugs. You're not talking about street drugs here. Yeah, street drugs, drugs are almost never involved with, uh, with shootings, and alcohol is almost never involved in shootings. I think in part because they disable people in ways that don't make it uh, possible for them to go ahead and do a lot of planning mm -hmm. and a lot of thinking through, where the psychiatric drugs allow for bizarre changes in your mental life, and your fantasy life, without necessarily incapacitating your, your planning abilities. Mm -hmm. It's a, something that's more unique to them because in order to sell and market psychiatric drugs, they can't be so grossly disabling. Because mm -hmm. you still have to be able to go to school, go to work. So, so you function on some level that's actually pretty good. And then... Well, until they increase the drugs and then you get people on four and five drugs and they're, they're too, too impaired to go out and do a school shooting. I don't think anybody can function normally on the combinations, or even reasonably normally, on the combinations of drugs that are frequently given to people. In fact, the person is made sick by the drugs, and then, then the parents or the family are told, well, you know, it, he's just getting sicker, or the drugs are unmasking his mania, or unmasking, masking his psychosis. And we just, in psychiatry, we commonly now just make people sicker and sicker and sicker, something we did not see when I was a young resident in psychiatry or in my early years of practice. Mm -hmm. You assume that people came and you talked to them and you helped them and maybe a psychiatrist would give one drug. Um, I, I don't give any, but maybe a psychiatrist, one of my colleagues would give one or two drugs, but never four or five of these very, very toxic, poisonous drugs. So, the, so just to clarify, because I think this is a really important point, the talking heads on TV are saying these people need psychiatrists, they need to be in the mental health system, that that would be the key to preventing it. And what you're saying is the reason it's happening is they're in the mental health system, they're being prescribed drugs that increase their tendency to do something like this. Well, you've leaped a little ahead of where I was. Okay. But basically, that. that's true. And in fact, one of the most common denominators of everyone who has been a shooter, and, uh, and especially the, the school shooters, is that they've been through psychiatry. It's even more of a common denominator than they're on the drugs, which is also a fairly common denominator. So if you look at the uh, Virginia Tech shooter, he had been through psychiatry, uh, he'd been hospitalized. Um, we still don't know whether or not he was on drugs. That's been really obscured uh, by the establishment. Um, uh, pretty much all the school shooters have had the attention of psychiatrists uh, and often counselors along the way. And they've all been on drugs, almost all of them, the young, young school shooters, have been on drugs along the way, psychiatric drugs. And we don't know exactly how many of them were on drugs at the time, but many of them were. 
and I, I've been a medical expert in two of the most infamous cases where I've been involved in cases surrounding it in some way, not necessarily in the criminal case. Um, Eric Harris, for example, who has actually been said by USA Today that he was not on drugs, and we know that now in retrospect, uh, was absolutely on drugs because I've seen the coroner's report of his blood tests, and I've also seen the drug company's report to the FDA. And the irony was is that he was on a, quote, therapeutic level mm -hmm. of an antidepressant, a so-called SSRI, which are the newer kinds of antidepressants. He was on Luvox. And that was, he was Columbine, right? He was a Columbine shooter. Okay. And so on the day that he shot all those people, and they had the bombs that didn't go off, and then they uh, probably shot each other, or, or maybe Eric Harris shot Dill and then shot himself. I don't know that that's clear. Uh, but on that day, Eric Harris had the therapeutic level in his system just what the psychiatrist would have wanted. And he fit the pattern of what we know about people getting worse on drugs, and that in the past several weeks, his medication dose has been increased. And I know from looking at his medical records, I'm one of the few people that's had access to them, that he was given the drugs about a year or two beforehand um, because he had obsessive thoughts. There was no hint of uh, even severe mental disturbance. There was no hint of any kind of serious violence or crime at that point. Although he wasn't obviously an angry kid and a kid who didn't treat other kids really nicely. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the shooter, uh, also in Colorado, but at the, uh, at the theater, mm -hmm. um, the Aurora Theater, he went to his uh, graduate school psychiatrist, he was studying neuroscience, he's a very bright guy. Again, a kind of shy, withdrawn boy, not very interactive with people, which is common. <coughs> Excuse me. And he actually told his psychiatrist that he was feeling so violent that he didn't dare tell her how violent he was feeling. And she uh, prided herself in being aware of issues like school shootings and campus safety. And she actually reported him to their safety officers. Um, but they really took no action other than she started him on the antidepressant Zoloft. Mm. It's like she's supposed to be an expert, but she hasn't even read the FDA's full prescribing information, apparently, for Zoloft and all the SSRIs, which says that they can cause aggressivity and hostility and um, out of control behavior and impulsivity. Which is exactly what leads to all this. And furthermore, the medication guide, which is supposed to be given to every patient. The FDA recommends the doctors discuss this medication guide. It's only a few pages with every patient. Says to be on the lookout for violent behaviors and any kind of change in behavior that you worry about. So it's not like the information is hidden. It's not so much hidden as psychiatrists can't see the information. Mm -hmm. It's a selective blindness to this information, which would so undermine the frivolous, widespread use of these drugs and would make you never want to give them to anybody who was irritable or angry or upset in that fashion or agitated, because they worsen those conditions and they do it commonly. Um, if we look at the Florida shooter, I was not involved in any legal cases with him, the Parkland School. Mm -hmm. um, his case is typical of why psychiatry does more harm than good. Um, about a year before the shootings, the school was very concerned about him. He seemed to be threatening, he seemed to be angry, some people had seen some threatening videos. And they asked child, the Child and Protective Services that was uh, appropriate for him to go to his, you know, to do something about this, to check him out. So there's this most remarkable report where Child and Protective Services goes to his home. He's um, not quite yet 18, so he can't go out and buy a gun. And they visit with him and his mother. And um, his mother says uh, that uh, he has, um, an air pistol, 
and um, I think it was a pistol, <clears throat> and that uh, he sometimes shoots it at inappropriate targets in the house, but otherwise he's okay with it, and she reprimands him as a 17-year-old. That's maybe 10-year-old behavior, and then you take the gun away. Um, the boy told the investigators from the family serv child and family services that he was going to buy a gun when he was 18 and refused to tell them why. So how come he didn't land in some sort of intensive scrutiny situation, right. like immediate hospitalization? Well, they called his clinic. He was in treatment at a clinic. So they got a hold of somebody who was described as his health, a healthcare provider, who reassured him that he reassured the investigators that he was taking his medications and was regularly coming to treatment. And so they thought everything was okay? Everything's okay, he's taking his drugs. When it's the opposite, everything's not okay, he's taking his drugs. Right. We don't, I have not yet been able to discover what he was or wasn't on at the time of the shootings. That kind of stuff is just really hidden. Um, but we certainly know that he was in psychiatric treatment, that he was getting worse on psychiatric drugs. Now, you don't have to uh, even be on the drugs at the time of the shooting because the drugs can make you crazy and you can stay that way for months or years. Mm -hmm. You can have a psychotic break. Now, in the case of the Aurora Theater shooter, he ran out of his Zoloft about 20 days before the school, before he went to the theater and stood there and just blown people down. But tracking his progression of getting online and buying guns and making plans, all that begins with being put on the antidepressant. There's not evidence that he was doing that beforehand. And then he uh, was in a profoundly disturbed and psychotic state by the time that he um, went ahead and did the shootings. So one thing, it, we have a couple, we have so many layers of things that are going wrong here, but, but psychiatrists believe that medicating these people helps. It doesn't, but they believe it. But then the entire system is set up for everybody to believe this. So Child Protective Services, in the case of the Parkland shooter, shows up and they say he's medicated. Okay, well then we don't have to worry. Somebody's yeah, they like, literally closed the case. Yeah, because everything is okay. Yeah. Then, then, of course, we have the media believes that everything is okay as long as they're in the mental health system and they're being drugged. And then that's what gets reported to everybody. And so obviously if these people, the real problem then is availability of guns. If we just took all the guns away, then nobody would have the opportunity to do this. <clears throat> yeah, I've written a blog, more psychiatry means more school shootings. I think that was the title of it. I mean, that's Psychiatrist wow. says more psychiatry means more school shootings. Now, one of the most interesting things I, I ever found in this whole vast um, amount of research that I've done in this area was I found a report before there were any school shootings of any note from um, a study that was about in 1989 or 90, very shortly after Prozac came out. And it was at Yale. And they were doing a study, a controlled clinical trial, where they were putting some, some boys, I don't know if they were girls, but some young people, um, on uh, Prozac and some on placebo. And one of the boys, I think he was 12 at the time, he's, he's written up in Medication Madness. A lot of what I'm talking about has been written up in Medication Madness or in my blogs, which you can get at Bregan.com. Um, and this boy reported, while he well, the, nobody knew whether he was on placebo or, or, or on the control, which is just a sugar pill, um, reported that he was feeling violent, having violent nightmares. And his violent nightmares, he reported, were about going to school and killing people. And How, when was this? What, what year? We're talking about, the study was probably in about 1989, 1990, just a year or so after Prozac came out. Okay. That's how early. One of the very earliest studies. And um, if you go to um, my website, I have a free resource center called 123antidepressants.com. 
two, three, antidepressants.com and look up violence and you'll find this study. I think the author of it was King. <clears throat> but you'll readily find it under the section on violence and, uh, and shootings. Um, you can get it on my website or just go right to it, 123antidepressants.com. I really want this information to go out. I've got well, that, I God do too. How, That's how why. Many, how many hours I got into that, I was going to say to explain how many hours I put into that, setting that website up. Um, it's uh, un incalculable hours. So um, they, um, they broke what's called bro breaking the code, and they found out that he was on the Prozac. So they removed him from the Prozac, and he gradually recovered and got a lot, lot better. And um, he then went home to be, you know, just a regular boy. Oh, with the nightmares, start his nightmares began to blend into unreality when he awoke, and he wasn't sure whether this was real, whether it was unreal. And so you're seeing, the, you're seeing a process that for, say, a 14, 15 year old, I think he was a little younger than that, could have led to the development of school shooting mentality. It starts with nightmares, and the antidepressants commonly cause horrendous nightmares, and then difficulty even telling the difference, and maybe getting into a lot of fantasy, eventually becoming psychotic. Psychotic psychosis is in many ways living in a nightmare, mm -hmm. where you no longer tell the difference be between the kinds of things that happen to you in a nightmare. Now I have a question about this. So this study goes back to right after Prozac came out, and it, it was published in a medical journal. Ah, a well-known medical journal. And nobody, By very well-known researcher. Nobody paid attention to it. No, I, I'm not aware that uh, King and or Riddle, who then went on to be at um, Johns Hopkins, ever said we should be we should really be careful or stop giving these drugs. Was it, was it just because it was one kid that this happened to, or was it? Well, no, because their studies were showing that a significant percentage of uh, the boys and girls taking these drugs, they did at least two studies, uh, maybe a third or 40% of people were getting agitated, anxious, upset, angry, distressed while on the drugs. And then when you took the drugs away, they would start to get better, or even if you reduced the dose in some cases. Do you think so? The, the information that I'm uh, supposedly presenting as radical and is, new, and, it's not new. new. It was all there from the beginning, and in part because of my work, a lot of it's actually in the FDA's full prescribing information. Because the FDA had my biggest article, the broadest article I wrote in um, 1993, roughly, in the International Journal of Risk and Safety in Medicine, was given which was, I was so happy about this, it was given to every member of the FDA's committee that was evaluating what changes should be made in the prescribing information. And, and so several sections read like my article where they're talking about a syndrome of, of what is essentially activation or overstimulation where you get aggression, you get hostility, you get impulsivity, you get insomnia, and at the extreme end you start to get mania and psychosis. And drought I was writing about that, and that got included in the label, but the establishment fought against the label and is still fighting against that label, saying it hurts kids by, by and people because they're reluctant to take the drugs. Um, and, but they haven't been able to get the FDA to back down on the label, and, they, and then the FDA put a lot of, put all of it into the medication uh, guide that goes along with the drugs. So this information was out there early on, and of course I was writing about it extensively and lecturing and going on TV about it and stuff early on. Now to put this in perspective, so the FDA doesn't take the drugs off the market, doesn't say may not prescribe <coughs> to kids, but doctors can prescribe off-label anyway, so they, they can't do anything about, as long as the drug's on the market, they can't keep kids from taking That's them. That's right. So and they won't take the drugs off the market. Is the is the prevailing thought, the common wisdom, that this would hurt so many people who need these drugs, that this is just, we have to live with this um, periodic violence because it's just a cost of medicating people who need the drugs? Or what's the rationale? I don't understand. Um, there's so much power and money behind the drugs. Uh, we have these multi-billion dollar industries, and now, under the rules that developed quite a ways back, 
the FDA um, takes money from the drug companies to expedite getting approval. Approval for drugs has gone uh, sky high since they companies have been paying to get them expedited. Go figure, right? So that almost all drugs are approved, whereas before a significant percentage weren't. You have the uh, medical schools supported by the drug companies. You have the, all the associations, psychiatric and medical, the main ones supported by the drug companies. So you, you, you live in a world where you're looking at things from the viewpoint of marketing for the drug companies. That's mm -hmm. literally the viewpoint. Mm -hmm. And that viewpoint is in the media, and that's been really powerful since uh, it was approved, uh, the government approved the uh, using the media to market psychiatric drugs directly to the public. We're the, it's only two countries that do that, U.S. and New Zealand. Crazy. And um, although I'm very, I'm a libertarian, I believe in freedom of speech, this is, this is beyond that, I think, with this marketing to the public. And um, that has, uh, has resulted in the media not covering any of this. I had more coverage about these issues in the early 1990s, before all the school shootings, than I have now. Much, much more. Because as soon as um, the uh, pharmaceutical industry could market to television and radio, and television was very striking, television simply stopped having critics of the drug companies on the air, or doing it very briefly, or doing somebody who's not quite a psychiatrist, or isn't quite as threatening. Um, and this has been a very dramatic change. I mean, uh, I, in the past, I'd be on NBC and ABC News uh, frequently. I'd be on the morning shows. I was on Oprah five times. I was on Larry King five or six times. I was, I was everywhere. And boy, they were able to just shut that down mm -hmm. once they obtained the right to market directly wow. to talent. So, I mean, it, it's hard not to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but essentially the drug companies have bought the FDA, they've bought the psychiatry profession, the medical profession in general, they've bought the academic medical research institutions, they've bought the media. And so the message that everybody's getting is the one that they orchestrate. And exactly. it's all working out. So somebody who works for Pfizer, Merck, or Eli Lilly is sitting at home watching this all go on and saying, We've got this under control, essentially. And it's hard to believe that people could be that careless or diabolical, and there are a lot of terms I can think of. Well, they have their rationalizations, you know? I mean, you know, we're preventing more suicides than we're causing or something like that, mm -hmm. for which there's no evidence. No drug has ever been shown to prevent suicide, and yet we've got many classes of drugs now that have been shown in these little four to six weeks trials let alone taking the drugs in the real world. That in the real world, world. Yeah. over months and years with other drugs and with alcohol or marijuana or something. Oh my gosh. So I'll give you a couple of examples that are, that are interesting. Um, after the, the really dreadful shooting of all of those little young children who were shot in the head up in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Sandy Hook. Uh, Sandy Hook. The, that was so dreadful that I saw on television, and then my researcher, Ian, bless him, captured this, and you can find it on the internet because of me, and you can find it on my website, and you can find it on uh, 123antidepressants.com. And uh, Sanjay Gupta said immediately after hearing about this, and he's standing there, and he's, he's just talking like off in a relaxed way, in an unprepared way. And he said, and of course we know that uh, violence can be caused by some of these psychiatric antidepressants, so we have to look into that. It's the only time I ever saw a physician on TV do that. And at the same week, or same few days, um, the head of Homeland Security, the former governor who was the initial head of mm -hmm. Homeland Security. I know what you mean. I have him captured saying virtually the same thing. And then never again. Yeah. So they'll maybe speak out from their heart for a minute, and then they get absolutely clobbered. Mm -hmm. And um, it's quite systematic. Mm -hmm. It's quite, quite systematic. And we have many examples of uh, recently, just a year or two ago, I was on um, 2020. 
about the drugs and violence. And um, no, I was on. Uh, this is a very impromptu presentation, folks. I didn't know I was going to do it until I said that. So I didn't get to even scan notes and refresh memory. But, um, oh gosh. It's a show with this Dr. Dr. Oz. Oh, Dr. Oz, okay. It was on Dr. Oz. And um, they filmed me um, about my views on the violence issues. And they also filmed a good psychiatrist in New York. And we were on for very brief on Skype. And then they filled the studio, like with three or four experts who actually knew nothing about this whole area, to talk about that this was all impossible. And then um, they put their show up on the air. And guess what happened when I went to look at it on the air? Did not include your segment. I was gone. And so oh was my God! Yeah, just a guy, just just gone. So I mean, this is the extent that this. It's impossible to exaggerate the extent to which this goes on. And I think it's partly that that us that didn't even realize just how hammered he was going to get, mm -hmm. because he did show me. And then, even though his audio, even though all his experts were saying no, 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 he came in and said, "Well, I just asked one of my." Ex assistance to Google school shootings and drugs. And we got this list where psychiatric drugs seem to be involved. And he pulled out this long list and he put down. And I mean, I was thinking, wow, that's something. Now, I think they may have left that in. I don't remember. But clearly, Oz, I think, didn't, didn't expect to get a hit it probably as hard as he was afterward. Mm -hmm. And they will hit as hard as they can. Well, and, and of course, what happens to somebody like Oz, he makes millions from that show. And so the thought of, I could lose all of this, Plus, when you start talking about, if you, if you have any questions about psychiatric drugs, vaccinations, anything that the drug companies do, the, look at what has happened to some of our colleagues, been discredited. Um, bad things can happen to you, if you, from a personal standpoint, That's right. if they really decide to come after you in a major way. Very bad things. Yeah. I mean, my life reads like uh, a, uh, I've not talked a lot about it, but it reads like you're, you know, you're, most threatening movie about a whistleblower. Mm -hmm. I'm, I feel very blessed to be alive. Yeah. To be alive and have lived a great life and, uh, and still living a great life. Well, and I think one of the things that's become helpful, because I've had a little bit of that too, mm -hmm. is you that. You have, because you're yeah. a real pioneer reformer. Yeah, all of us have, anybody who's done, doing this. Mm -hmm. I think this type of thing is one of the things that's protected us a little bit because. You know, it's harder to get rid of people who a lot of people know about, I think. That's I think that's right. The most vicious attacks on me was when I was the a single scientific expert appointed by a federal court to be the scientific expert to evaluate all the Prozac suits in the early 1990s. So there were like 150 more suits against Eli Lilly for Prozac causing violence and murder and mayhem and suicide. <clears throat> and I was the person who was looking into Eli Lilly's secret files and evaluating them for, the, for potential trials. And it was at that point that the attacks on me were the very real. Mm -hmm. And um, I can't attribute them to Eli Lilly, and there were other drug companies becoming involved as makers of these things, but... Um, well, people with those types of resources can cover their tracks pretty well. Well, I think that's right. I mean, I know that's right from li living with it for, for years and years. And now we have Peter Gerza, who is this amazing physician in Denmark, internist who created, helped create the uh, Cochrane's uh, collaboration, which has been the, the most dedicated monitor of medical science and scientific publications uh, that we have ever had. And since it is, it does involve people other than Peter, it's not perfect, but it, was, it has been very, very important. And when Peter began to attack psychiatry, and probably also when he began to attack the vaccinations, they have now gone after him to try to um, fire him. Well, first they actually threw him out of the very thing he created, the Corcoran collaboration. And um, there's lots of protests going on about it. Maybe it can be reversed. 
And then they gave notice of firing him from the institute he created in Denmark. And I'm uh, trying to work with Pam and some other people to set up a, a conference in defense of him in March in um, Copenhagen. In Copenhagen. We're going I, I to hope, Denmark. I hope that will come off. Um, it, it's got difficulties, but um, we're really aiming in that direction. And, but this is the world of oppression that goes on. Now, people don't expect it in the healthcare profession. When, remember that the tobacco industry fought the idea that smoking caused cancer for decades. And with their huge power, buying judges, uh, getting, the, getting the most unscrupulous attorneys, some of whom I've been up against on, on the drug issues, um, to go to court and do everything they can to harass and bully and control the situation. Mm -hmm. They kept the courts for years from deciding that, uh, that cigarettes caused cancer and kept the government from taking any actions for decades. Um, but we say, oh, well, we expect that because that's cigarettes. I mean, we expect them to give them away free to guys, to, the, to our boys in prison camps overseas uh, in the Nazi and Japanese prison camps. The last thing they need was cigarettes. Uh, because they know if they can market to youth, they've got people hooked for life. And we know that they had camels and things that would market to children, because you hook children, you've got them for the rest of their life. And we say, well, okay, we can understand that. But the drug companies know different than the cigarette companies, and I do believe that probably some of them might even be the same, and certainly their boards of directors interlock. And I do know that the law firms that defend them are the, sometimes the same ones I've been up against. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of them occurs to me is Shukardi and Bacon, for example, was big tobacco, and then they, they went against, then they went for big Prozac, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and Eli Lilly. So, yes, this is the world we live in, and thank God for people like uh, Pam, and I do my best, and Peter Gerza, and. And then we're going to ask you guys to do your best because really what we've talked about here is, is a, a, a ginormous enterprise that keeps people from knowing about this. So the only way people will know about this is if you tell others and forward this video on to people who you know, the link to it. And if we can get millions and millions and millions of people, what stands between where we are with this and, and where we need to be is tens of millions of people in the United States knowing that this is going on. That's what would stop it, because if we dry up the demand, That's in other right. words, if parents don't, don't allow their children to be drugged, we won't find ourselves in this situation. Parents are doing their best, they don't know. And I'm sure that the Parkland shooter's mother didn't know that she was doing the wrong thing. So we're counting on you to spread the word. This is really, really, really one of those videos that I'm gonna ask you to pass on to other people who you know should see it who you know would be inspired, horrified, all the terms that come to your mind about this. And hit that subscribe button too, so you can get more videos like this. I thank you so much for all the work that you've done and also for coming to Columbus to speak to our people. Let me add a sentence in here. Yes, please do. Because I want to I wanna include the nutritional aspect of this a little more. Okay. Because when I uh, have been reading um, Campbell's book, mm -hmm. Uh, called Whole, W-H-O-L-E, in which he is describing what he went through in standing up for Whole Foods uh, in government committees and at Cornell where he's a professor. <clears throat> he went through some of what, for example, myself, Peter Gertz, and, and Pam have gone through. Um, for example, he's now a retired professor at Cornell, he's, and he has the right to uh, to be uh, to teach at the school. And the only way he's allowed to teach is in the uh, as an online program. He's not allowed no. to stand in front of students and teach, and it's against the rules, as far as I know. And and he has been, you know, marginalized as much as they're able to do. But I'm not as aware of his having his life threatened and attacked, and uh, you know his family put in jeopardy for their lives prison. and stuff. Prison. And prison, which <laughs> yeah, Bam was threatened, threatened with. with. <laughs> and me too, I got threatened with prison along the way. 
Well, it's sort of like a badge of honor in our group. You know, if you haven't been threatened by government or somebody, <laughs> then you just haven't arrived. You or, haven't had an effect. Yeah, you haven't had a big enough effect yet. So it's, kind of, it's sort of when, when uh, I heard about Gertrude, as awful as it was, it's like, well, he's joined the club. Now they're after Well, you him said too. something very important. You said that he, if he gets fired from his institute, he'll be liberated. Mm -hmm. I don't know what his economics are, but he may even find a benefactor outside the establishment. Well, I did we once know, or twice. We know how to help that. We know. We know and you, you, you know how to help that. You're we very good at helping people market and, and develop independent incomes. Um, but you know, uh, just f in finally closing, look at how happy she, this woman is, and look at how happy I am. And, yeah. Um, you in know, spite of all this. In spite of all this. So you can. F you can, as long as you're allowed to live, which is no guarantee of, you can live as best you can, believing in what you do, working on loving relationships, believing that what this is really about is not rage and hate. I mean, I was an angry young man when I started, but you can't keep up like that, be a reformer. You have to develop a loving attitude toward what you're doing and the treasuring of the people you're helping and a caring about humanity with all its flaws and caring about yourself with all your own flaws. Um, and you can develop a, uh, an attitude that says there's something greater going on than ourselves. And, and then there's chances and maybe God's hand as to whether you live and survive and have an impact. That is not totally under our control by any means. But you can live a good life being a reformer. Yeah, and, and um, I, I'm with you. I'm not angry anymore. I'm just determined. <laughs> determined. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for watching. Pass this on. Be back to you Thursday with more news.